Hi, this is the start of session 2.3. Maybe you already wondered about the large number of stakeholders in a trial, how to combine their knowledge effectively. Well, organizing a trial is like going through a cycle multiple times. This session will familiarize you with the concept of iteration and co-creation within the six-step approach. It is targeted at trial organizers and also advice for practitioners, solution providers and developers, technicians. The focus is on the idea of iteration within the TGM, the idea of co-creation within the TGM, and how the technical infrastructure tools can support you in preparation phase. By now, you have seen the three phases of the trial guidance methodology and the different steps of the preparation phase. Now you might think that this phase is a large linear process, but it actually is not. You should iterate. That means that you should go through the steps multiple times and that you will adjust your trial design as you move from rough ideas to the details. Besides repeating, iterating also means jumping in between steps. When you adjust or detail out one thing, you probably have to go to another step and adjust or detail out that step as well. Although it mainly refers to the preparation phase, iteration can also take place in the execution and evaluation phase. First, we talk about the iteration process and the impact within the iteration. Then we quickly present the roles and responsibilities in your trial committee. But beforehand, we take another look at the user story. Episode 25 Iteration in the preparation phase. Sharing the happiness at the end of the week with your colleagues gave you new energy, but also new reflections. Now you look back at the six-step approach and think, I've done each step, but still this does not feel like a whole event. It all seems very academic and not yet very practical. I feel like going around in circles. Where does it lead to? While preparing a trial, at some point in time, you will definitely become aware that things are changing while you are working on them. So be prepared for some iteration in the process. You started rather broad with an initial idea and you end very detailed with tailored research questions, a meticulous data collection plan and so on. It takes some time, but you can be sure your preparations will improve by allowing iterations. As long as the life philosophy of the very famous Pippi is I've never done it, so I think I can. You will be able to start somewhere, in a very generic way, and trust the methodology to assist you in refining it. You don't have to be perfect from the start. And rest assured that there is no need to go through every step over and over again. Your objectives and selected solutions do not change. On the other hand, everything else could get more detailed. So feel free to jump between the steps. But in the end, you have to make sure that everything you decided to observe and log can indeed be observed, logged and measured. Refinements For example, since you selected just two solutions for your trial, you can adjust your initial planning. Because both solutions provide the same kind of functionalities, you assess the option to have three runs during your trial, one baseline run, and one run per innovative solution. This also leads you to the decision to narrow down the trial objective a little more. Instead of looking for assistance for better informed decision making, you state more specifically, we want to assess and optimize the time spent on and decisions made regarding evacuation during floods. We want to assess how visualization can support the decision making, specifically the prioritization of the evacuation. Now you refine the research question. The original question was, can more detailed information increase the efficiency of evacuation in case of a flood? The answer could be yes or no, but still you don't know more about the solution. So you decide to reformulate your research question as follows. How can more detailed information, in the form of a model and or a visualization of the flood, 
Increase the efficiency of evacuation in case of a flood. The sentence is long already, but the word efficiency has to be elaborated. That leads to two measurable facts. Research question 1. Will the evacuation be sooner and faster when the decision-making is based on the more detailed information? Research question 2. Will the impact on people, infrastructure and environment be minimised when the decision-making is based on the more detailed information? Does that change anything for the data collection plan? Yes, because while you are thinking about your trial, you realise that the duration to make each decision is not so important. So you decide to skip the time measurement. No, think twice. If you measure the time not for every single action, but from the moment that your participants were given the task until the decision to evacuate and in which order to evacuate is made, you will be able to assess if the new total evacuation process is faster or more efficient in case of an evacuation plan that is based on newly available information. Therefore, keep the planned time measurement but use the results in a different way. You should also add measurements related to using the solutions to find a more efficient order of evacuation. Because the data collection and evaluation plan will focus on the effects of the evacuation plan the participants came up with while using and not using the solutions, you need evacuation experts and models to review and validate these plans. For measuring the improvement of decision-making, you assume that if there is less information and variables to consider, the decision-making process will be quicker and more feasible. Or the other way around, if there is more information, people tend to take longer to decide and find this decision-making tougher because of the abundance of information. The positive or negative verification of the above-mentioned assumptions can be done by measurement of so-called key performance indicators, or KPIs. Remember, you phoned the TGM expert at the Centre of Expertise and talked about defining the KPIs and the thresholds later on. Now you feel you have detailed your trial setup well enough to nail them down. The first indicator is the evacuation order of four specific areas within your city. Your threshold will be whether the reasoning behind the order of evacuation stated by the trial participants is in line with the area's expected risk and time of flooding. The second indicator consists of three time slots. Time slot 1 is the time needed by the team of participants to analyse the information and have a situational overview. Time slot 2 is the time needed to indicate which areas should be evacuated. And time slot 3 is the time needed by the team to communicate their evacuation plan with evacuation areas prioritised and a clear advice on whether or not to evacuate. The threshold for this second indicator is the time remaining between this plan being communicated and the areas being flooded, as it would not be possible to evacuate any area anymore once the flood has reached this area. If needed, it is possible to calculate the total time it took the participants from the moment they were given the information and task until the evacuation plan for those four specific areas is ready. But you decide it is not needed to measure this, but only to measure the three time slots and to record the evacuation plan the team has come up with. Episode 26. Trial Action Plan. Are you ready for action now? Yes, because every detail has been prepared and refined in different loops. And no. Because as the trial evolves to be more and more determined, the need occurs to better organise and document the work you and your colleagues have done. While the TGT helps you in going through all of the steps of the TGM, you also heard of a document called the Trial Action Plan, or TAP in short. You, as a team, use the TAP to document all your decisions taken and the status of preparations. The TAP can thus be seen as a collection of all exports of the TGT, plus a documentation of the practical and technical preparations and open action points. At the end of the preparation phase, you have documented your playbook, or battle plan, on how to execute and evaluate your trial, and the reasoning of how you came to this setup. You download the TAP template, which comes with self-descriptive guidelines. Every section of the TAP links with the applicable step in the TGM and TGT. 
The tap is designed to be a living document, meaning a document that is continuously being edited and updated by all persons involved in organizing the trial. Or looked at from another angle, because the TGM is an iterative methodology, the document in which you describe the outcomes of every methodological step is a living document as these outcomes are continuously updated. You decide to give it a go. Your colleagues most probably would like to have a tap in the trial. Yes, you allow yourself a little joke once in a while. And you discover the tap is also great to communicate your ideas and progress to the expert from the center of expertise whom you consulted about the evaluation approach. Then the day comes that one of your new colleagues comes up to you and asks, am I in? Tell me what I'm asked to do. Who, for example, is going to collect all the data and how and where? Are you still looking for participants? This seems to be the perfect moment to distribute the outputs of your preparation phase in a wider committee and to announce the start of the execution phase. Let's find out and rehearse it together. We now come to the iteration process and the impact within iteration. Let's start with the process of iteration. The design of a trial implies a co-creative approach and an open mind, as key decisions must be taken in agreement with different stakeholders that need to be identified. You will need to talk a lot with the solution providers, with your colleagues, with the experts on the gaps and the gap process, as well as with your data collection and evaluation people. The preparations of trials are evolving processes. They grow in the making, like a handcrafted artifact. Time should be devoted to create space for discussion between different roles and to adjust the design step by step. This also implies that iteration is needed, especially during the six-step approach of the preparation phase to optimize the design. While iterating, workshops and tools are essential. And don't be afraid to jump from step to step. Work on the aspect on that you have new information and then see how this influences the other steps. All the steps of the six-step approach are interlinked, and hence changes in one step will most probably also cause changes in the others. This is why we start with the bigger picture and detail our way to the trial. First things first, what is your why? What is your aim with this trial? What is your goal? You come from the gaps and know your trial context. Now what do you really want to do? This is your trial objective. Your trial objective is your starting point for the six-step approach. After each big change, come back to the trial objective and ask yourself, do we still fulfill this? One thing that might come to your mind after the first round of the six-step approach is to directly showcase the solution's functionality to your supervisor and colleagues. But you should resist this impulse. This is about bridging a real crisis management gap that is embedded in a realistic scenario. It is absolutely okay to revisit the scenario and to tweak it a bit. The scenario has to trigger the gap and to address your trial context. It should not contain episodes that are only there because they are nice to run or to let the participants shine. In the end, you want to know if this solution really, actually addresses your specific gap in your specific context. If it turns out this solution does not bridge your gap, so be it. This might still be a great solution, just not in your very specific gap. And therefore, always stay true to your gap and your trial context. Every time your information changes, you might want to update other parts of this cycle. So revisit each step and see whether it is still applicable for assessing the selected solution. What impact does your selected solution have on your data collection plan, the chosen evaluation approach, and the scenario you drafted? For example, if you have chosen a particular solution, you have to update your data collection plan to the specific characteristics of this solution. So you might have to cut some pieces out, and you probably need to add or describe some parts in more detail. Now you have selected one or more solutions and detailed out the other steps accordingly. Still, your trial objective holds. Great. The next step is feasibility. You might envision a great trial, like those large Driver Plus trials, with 300 participants and a massive live exercise terrain in the background. Do a reality check at this point. Talk to your manager and colleagues. What is feasible? How many resources can you use? Also, what is your setting? 
Is it a real-life exercise with boots on the ground, or is it more like a tabletop exercise? Can you use digital simulation to create a more immersive situation? What kind of resources, human, expertise, equipment, technique, tools, and so on do you need? Is it realistic to get those? And on another note, what does the solution require? For example, can you actually test that drone solution in your country? Check the legislation. And again, after all those changes, are you still aligned with your trial objective? Now we present the roles and responsibilities of the four main roles in your trial committee. You may have already heard it in session 2.1. When iterating through the TGM steps, you need several experts. So you form a team with your colleagues and potentially even external experts. A committee consists of the following roles. Trial owner, practitioner coordinator, evaluation coordinator, and technical coordinator. Note, if you are a small team, a single expert can take over multiple roles at once. We start with presenting the trial owner. The owner of a trial is the crisis management organization, which is mainly responsible for the trial itself. While on the one hand, trials are collective efforts, there should be one organization that takes up the responsibility for planning, executing, and evaluating the activities. This important role encompasses the following responsibilities. A. Developing a proper scenario so that the gaps and needs of the main stakeholder are captured in the trial, scenario development. B. Hosting the trial itself using one or more locations and ensuring that the chosen location is apt to the purpose of the trial trial host. C. Directing the trial. The director has a prominent role in all phases and, as the name suggests, he or she gives the right directions. For instance, the director initiates the trial during the actual execution and is entitled to stop it any time, in case of problems and or to put in place mitigation actions. D. Managing the trial event in terms of logistics, e.g. rooms and equipment. Safety e.g. make sure that the people involved in the trial are not in danger. Media, e.g. dealing with the media before and after the event. And participants, from active to passive actors, players, observers and guests. Let's continue with the practitioner coordinator. The TGM stands for a practitioner-driven approach, which is by design reflected in every phase and step. The term practitioners stands for all relevant stakeholders in crisis management. In order to ensure the practitioner-driven nature of the trial guidance methodology, a dedicated practitioner coordinator shall serve as a proper guard. The first responsibility covers the co-participation of CM practitioners in the respective phases and steps of the TGM application. Here, it is key to identify relevant stakeholders for each trial context. Additionally, a clear communication of expectations needs to be ensured so that all practitioners are aware that their participation is also needed after the trial execution to contribute to the sense-making and dissemination of the trial results. The practitioner coordinator should be very sensitive to effectively request a minimum commitment of CM practitioner's involvement, while respecting the tight side restrictions practitioners have with regards to their daily duties. At the same time, this role will be regularly confronted with rather high expectations from the other roles in the TC, so that a proper translation and communication of practitioners' realities becomes vital. The second responsibility targets a well-balanced CM practitioner relationship management. This rather management-oriented task goes beyond the content-related co-participation of CM practitioners because it refers to the establishment and maintenance of a pool of practitioners as direct trial participants and, indirectly participating, trial observers. The main functions cover contact management, communication and reporting tasks. Similar to the practitioner coordinator, the evaluation coordinator requires a dedicated role because of the importance of executing trials. The overall goal of trials is a robust assessment of potentially innovative solutions. In turn, the actual evaluation calls for neutrality, independence, and an adequate degree of decision-making power. Therefore, it is recommended to confide the following responsibilities to someone who is not in charge for the activities of the other roles. In order to ensure a high evaluation quality, the evaluation coordinator needs to carefully question and verify the overall testbed application from the very beginning up to the end of a trial. To do so, a close interaction with the practitioner coordinator is important. 
as a next task, an alignment between the practitioner's inputs and the trial owner decisions is needed and should be secured by the evaluation coordinator. These results need to be communicated continuously to the technical coordinator, who in turn should feedback the alignment checks on a regular basis. In an ideal setup, this might lead to a highly robust assessment of innovative solutions in realistic setups. However, reality implies several limitations, like the partial availability of practitioners, an insufficient length of the trial execution, or inadequate depiction of real scenarios in virtual simulations. Therefore, trade-offs need to be done, and the evaluation coordinator plays a key role in balancing costs and benefits of different setups. The next responsibility covers the trial evaluation management. Here, the evaluation coordinator is in charge of translating the agreed objectives and side restrictions of the trial dimension into proper metrics and target values. This task requires a strong collaboration with the trial owner. The same applies to the solution evaluation management. In this area, the evaluation coordinator is tasked to transform the solution specifications into the solution dimension of the data collection plan. The main collaboration takes place with the technical coordinator, who should align the suggested metrics with the involved solution providers. Their feedback should be properly incorporated so that the solutions are assessed according to what they are supposed or intended to support. In turn, the evaluation coordinator is in charge of an adequate feedback of the assessment results to the solution providers. Probably the most challenging responsibility refers to the CM evaluation management. Here, the evaluation coordinator relies on a proper input on how the practitioners perceive the effectiveness of CM operations simulated during the trial. Those definitions are key to elicit the real impact of a solution on the CM performance. In consequence, the required CM practitioner profiles need to be communicated in advance to the practitioner coordinator in order to have access to this tremendous important basis of a trial. Another important step during the preparation phase is to communicate the scenario-related metrics to the trial owner in order to ensure an adequate depiction of the actual work practices in the scenario. Last but not least, the technical coordinator needs to be informed about which data is required from the testbed so that the relevant data will be collected and stored in a proper quality, format and amount. Finally, during the evaluation phase, the main task is to relate the results in the CM dimension to the results in the trial and solution dimensions. Changes in the CM performance have to be explained through a proper sense-making regarding a potential cause-effect relationship. The technical coordinator is responsible for a proper technical setup of the trial scenario, so that an adequate assessment of the selected solutions is ensured. Specifically, the following three responsibilities should be covered by the technical coordinator. The first aspect is the application of the technical testbed infrastructure. The technical coordinator makes sure that the testbed technical infrastructure is adjusted according to the decisions taken in the preparation phase and to the lessons learned during the rehearsal and that all components work together smoothly with the trialed solutions. During the trial, the technical coordinator oversees all technical aspects, e.g. integration with legacy tools at the trial location, data exchange, etc. This is why the technical coordinator is also in charge of a proper solution provider's management. Solution providers are actively involved in the development of the trial, as they know how to best integrate their solutions in the trial scenarios. Therefore, solution providers need to participate in relevant meetings prior to the execution phase so that they can get a comprehensive overview of the activities. The role of the technical coordinator does not end at the end of the trial execution. In fact, the technical coordinator works closely with the evaluation coordinator to provide insights on the overall testbed application. Another key responsibility is the training management to be provided to the trial participants. The technical coordinator takes decisions with regards to the training needs by deciding how to train the players who actively use the selected solutions during the trial. To do this, solutions providers must be instructed and involved in the overall trial design from the onset. This is the end of session 2.3. Thank you for your attention.